April of 1983. A young Mark Hamill must have been feeling pretty good. He'd completed his role as Luke Skywalker in the third and final Star Wars movie. Currently, he was starring on Broadway as Mozart in the play Amadeus. So one day, during the play's intermission or something, nerd boy Mark sneaks out to the comic book shop to stock up on his superhero fix. Inside West Side Comics, he saw something on the shelf that shocked and angered him. This book. Oh, it's not true. That's impossible! Marvel Comics adaptation of Return of the Jedi. In full color, the entire story in one prestigious book. Only problem was, the book was being offered for sale a month before the film's release. Marvel Comics wasn't supposed to do that. The final installment of the Star Wars saga, Return of the Jedi, went into production under a massive cloak of secrecy. As all fans know, the working title was Blue Harvest. No one was trusted with a full copy of the script. Nobody will let me see this film. Nobody will tell me one word about it. Why is there this umbrella of secrecy around this film? Don't feel bad, Maria. They would have scenes, they'd come in and give me pages, have me memorize them there and shred them. You know, Right I, on the spot. Yeah, it was like being in the Nixon administration. They couldn't even advertise the action figures. On the back of the card, the picture of the Ewoks was blacked out because Lucas didn't want you to know what they looked like until the movie came out. So the filmmakers put all that effort into keeping things quiet, but then a month before the movie comes out, Marvel publishes the entire story in a 64-page comic any bozo can breeze through in five minutes. All the secrets are in there. Clumsy Boba Fett dying, the revelation Luke and Leia are siblings, Darth Vader turning from the dark side of the Force and sacrificing himself to save Luke. Soon will I rest. Yes. Forever sleep. The only odd omission is Yoda's death scene. We see him yammering away at Luke, lecturing him about some shit, and in the next panel he's gone. And the caption just says, Luke leaves Yoda to much needed rest. I guess they wanted the kids to read between the lines. Yoda's taking the big sleep. Mark Hamill must have blabbed Lucasfilm, because the next thing you know, Marvel is going into full-fledged damage control. Two members of Marvel's PR department show up at Westside Comics and grab all the Return of the Jedi books. Store manager Dave Toplitz is quoted in the July 1983 issue of the Comics Journal, describing the encounter as, kind of nice, but very threatening. This was a pretty big screw-up. Marvel was probably worried about being sued by Lucasfilm for breaking their contract not to release the book before the film, or even worse, losing the license to publish Star Wars comics entirely. So now Marvel is making phone calls, sending letters, telegrams even, insisting store owners stop selling the Return of the Jedi comic. Naturally, most of the stores told them to go pound sand. Most comic shops are independently owned businesses that operate on a razor-thin margin. The Return of the Jedi comic was an expensive book, retailing for two and a half dollars at a time when the average comic cost 60 cents. Store owners couldn't afford to sit on expensive stock for weeks on end. They needed to sell those books to get their money back so they could pay for next week's comics. It was really unfair of Marvel to demand store owners sacrifice their business just to fix a mistake Marvel made. I'm sure that we can work out an arrangement which will be mutually beneficial and enable us to avoid any unpleasant confrontation. The comic stores had no agreement with Lucasfilm. Marvel didn't stipulate the books couldn't be sold until May 25th when they sold them. So once the comic shops had paid for the books, there really wasn't any legal or more reason they couldn't do with them what they wanted. An estimated tens of thousands of copies of Return of the Jedi were sold, but that didn't seem to hurt the movie. It quickly became one of the highest grossing films of all time. I mean, it's sort of like Star Wars. You want to go see it over and over again. You think you're going to be back for more? Mm, for sure, as soon as I get back from London. Kids bought action figures, toothbrushes, and Ewok stuffed toys by the millions. The movie was a huge success, and Lucas raked in a lot of money. Curiously, the novelization was also released before the film, but only by a week. No one seemed to care. As time went on, Lucasfilm seemed to become less and less concerned with spoilers. When the Phantom Menace soundtrack came out in 99, one of the tracks was titled Qui-Gon's Noble End. And just in case you missed it, another track was called Qui-Gon's Funeral. What? 
I just bought a whole box of this asshole's figure. Now you're telling me he's dead? Thanks. I looked at the track listings for the earlier Star Wars soundtracks, just to confirm they didn't give anything away. They're titled stuff like Darth Vader's Theme, Han Solo and the Princess, The Battle in the Snow. You'll notice none of them are titled something like Lando Double Crosses Han and Leia, or Vader is Luke's father, or even in the next movie, you'll find out he's been kissing his sister. You think you're gonna be back for more? Mm, for sure, as soon as I get back from London. Shenanigans, it's been a lot of fun, shenanigans. But now we've gotta run, it's funny how the minutes seem to fly.